DiscerningHearts.com presents Regnum Novum, bringing forth the new evangelization through Catholic social teaching with Omar Gutierrez. Omar Gutierrez is the special assistant to the Archbishop of Omaha, as well as the manager of the Office of Missions and Justice. He's had numerous articles published in various Catholic publications and is a highly sought-after speaker on various aspects of Catholic social teaching. He is also the author of The Urging of Christ's Love, The Saints and the Social Teaching of the Catholic Church. Regnum Novum, bringing forth the new evangelization through Catholic social teaching with Omar Gutierrez. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Let's go back for the listener and review the first two points in Catholic social teaching that helps lead us to what we're going to be discussing today. Well, the first of them is is the centrality of Christ Jesus. You, we have to start there. It's all about getting to know him and allowing that relationship with him to to inform what we do in the social doctrine. And the second one is a, a paradigm shift in the way we view our action. It's a conceptual change away from oppositionist paradigms to communion, which requires opening ourselves up to the good of our neighbor and opening ourselves up to the, the good that Christ wants to draw from us. We change then from those first two to the next three, four, five, to the next three, we change then from the more conceptual to the more practical. The third point would be then to look, judge, act. Very practical. Yes. Very practical, almost a methodology. Exactly right. And this, the, the, the term look, judge, act, the terms come straight from Blessed Pope John XXIII, who is so very practical, um, who was you know, a farm boy in, and, and made good by becoming the, the pontiff of the vicar of Christ on earth. He was a man who was very practical and very down to earth. And it's in Mater et Magistra, Mother and Teacher, that encyclical of 1961, on the 70th anniversary of Rerum Novarum, that he presents, actually in a section called Practical Suggestions, mm-hmm. this understanding of look, judge, act. And that's in paragraph 236, uh, where he says, um, one reviews the concrete situation, one forms a judgment in light of the same principles, and one decides what in the circumstances can and should be done to implement those principles. These are the three stages that are usually expressed in the terms look, judge, act. And that's from Mater et Magistra. These, these three are also referred to in, in a great deal of the social doctrine since 1961 as principles for reflection, criteria for judgment, and directives for action. That's what the social doctrine does on a practical, concrete level. Principles for reflection, criteria for judgment, and directives for action. I'm an average pew person, a lay person within the church. What am I looking for? I want to understand Catholic social mm-hmm. teaching. I want to be able to implement. Where do I begin, and what do I begin to look for? That's the great question, because I think we start to tie in then the previous two points about our relationship with Christ and communion to look, judge, act. When we look at the first one, for instance, just look, one might be tempted to simply say, well, we can simply look around us and see what the problems might be and simply, and then move forward. What we have to understand in the social doctrine is since it comes out of a relationship with Christ, the ability to look is just that, an ability. It's a grace. It's something we have to pray for. Mm-hmm. It's not guaranteed that we'll be able to see the poverty or the pain around us or even see necessarily that there are different kinds of poverty, that there is more to us than simply our material needs. So the looking that we're asking for in Look, Judge, Act is a looking that has to be granted to us by the grace of Christ and in relationship with him to see precisely what is the pain that needs to be healed. He's never going to show you something you can't handle or have a solution for. Is that correct? That's right. That's why our prayer life, deepening that prayer life, experiencing the sacraments and the richness that is provided to us by the Church is so essential because, as you said, it's in relationship with Christ. He's showing us what He needs us to see. Exactly right. And this requires 
again, we're getting into the practical here, this requires formation. It requires formation for the person who's doing the seeing. In this case, with the looking, it requires a spiritual formation. It requires the ability to discern. It requires the ability to receive what's being put before us. So we start to see then in the social doctrine very practical points that start with, again, relationship with Christ and that paradigm shift towards communion, but now formation and judge, look, judge, act has to reflect or has to form us, rather, has to change us to be able to receive what, we, what we're looking at and to be able to see the, the real need in the society. So we look from that, from our shared prayer with Christ in union mm-hmm. with him and communion with him, mm-hmm. we look at the world around us. And what are the types of things that we could potentially see in the world that we're in right now? Well, we can see uh, quite clearly the material need of our brothers and sisters. Um, we can see, uh, very scripturally, we see the widow. We can see the orphan, right? Mm-hmm. We can see those who have been abandoned. We can see the pain that's there in loneliness. We can see the pain that's there in having been rejected or in having uh, lost a father or you know the death of a loved one. Uh, those are the sorts of things we can see. But we also can see uh, spiritual pains, pains of, of, of abandonment from God, pains of, of uh, a kind of alienation from God, which are real concrete pains in some people's lives. We also see not just the, what's present before us right now, but we also see future. We can also look into the future and know how the action decisions we make right now might, might fit with the future. When we talk about the principle of solidarity later, we'll understand that solidarity per- pertains not just to us here right now and those ill and, and impoverished before us, but also those to come. We must have chronological solidarity with those who come after us. And then, of course, we also can see not just those who are physically right before us, but those on the other side of the world. Uh, and see their pain and how what we do now can affect poor or ill those on the other side of the world. For those who have eyes to see, Mm -hmm. there is so much. If we truly have the eyes of Christ, you you begin to see a world that is broken and is in need of a lot of love, care, compassion. But for the individual, what are you to do? What can you do given what gifts and graces God has placed in your life, and that would lead you to the next step in judging, correct? Exactly right, because as you were saying, you know, for those who have eyes to see, the heart has to has to be well formed, the heart has to be softened, the heart has to be formed by Christ Jesus, by his own heart, and in that heart and receiving that heart, we have we have judgment. What is it, G.K. Chesterton said that the, the longest road a man would, would travel would be from his head to his heart. The, the two working together in judgment is what the church understands by judgment, criteria for judgment. It's not some sort of cold calculation, and it's not, and I say this in respect to those perhaps in the far right or in the libertarian sort of uh, approaches to economics where it seems the, the argument for the best economic system is the argument for the most efficient system. Efficiency is not of the heart. Mm-hmm. Okay? Efficiency is of the mind only. And while certainly waste is, is bad, uh, sometimes, you, you know, one knows this when, when raising children, sometimes what can seem wasteful and, and inefficient is actually the most formative, deeply personal uh, event one can have with a child or with a spouse. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in judging, we have to open up uh, our hearts and link that with our minds so that we can receive what we see and, and deal with it well and then go on. Now, naturally, again, to properly judge, to have the heart and mind working together requires formation, requires understanding what the criteria are for judgment. In the last encyclical by Pope Benedict XVI, Caritas and Veritate, Charity and Truth, he he begins from the start by saying charity, the work that we do in, in, in caring for the poor, has to be grounded in truth because if it isn't, he says it can be um, it can degenerate into mere sentimentality. That's the other danger with the heart. Sometimes if you're too heart-centered, it degenerates into mere sentimentality. It degenerates into good feelings and emotions and isn't informed by the mind and, and the life of the mind and the truth, facts of the, the nature of the human person. 
that as much as you would like to do this thing for X person, it's actually not good for them. Mm-hmm. And that you need to be perhaps a bit harder or, or more demanding. Would the adage be appropriate, the, the one we hear about how if you give a man a fish, you have fed him, but if you teach him how to fish, you've given him food for a lifetime? Absolutely. Precisely right. And that that brings in wisdom. And what, what I want to g- communicate here is that these are not practical steps in the sense that they're, you know, if you follow A, B, C in this order in a nice intellectual kind of guy, as guys, we kind of want, well, what do you want me to do? Just give me X, Y, Z. All of this presumes you're getting the formation in the spiritual life. You're fostering that relationship with Christ and communion with your neighbors and the, the church, of course, is crucial and the sacraments. and the, you're, All that has to come first. That's why I put it one and two, right? Mm-hmm. So wisdom, which we receive as a grace— through the sacraments. Wisdom has to be part of it so that you can see, for instance, uh, what good will this do for my friend and how can I help them out in the long term by teaching them how to fish. Um, or will you have the example, for instance, of a, uh, of a fellow out in, in L.A. His name is Rudy Carrasco, and he, he founded in East L.A. where he grew up some means to be able to employ young men and women and his temptation at the very beginning, and he did this for a number of, of years, was in order to maintain their sense of self-esteem, he refused to fire any of them from this sort of job uh, apprenticeship because he was afraid that would discourage them. But what happened was is when they graduated from his program and went out into the real, real world, they got fired mm-hmm. because they didn't think anything they would do would get them fired, and they were disrespectful, they wouldn't show up on time, they didn't do the hard work. So he realized almost counterintuitively, that he had to be hard on them. He had to go forward and demand of them standards that they had to reach, and and eventually they appreciated that. They got more out of the labor they were able to complete, and then they they permanently or for longer periods of time stayed away from the life of of gangs in East L.A. Mm -hmm. because more was demanded of them. Judgment requires and the heart requires having the courage to choose what is counterintuitive to get at the truth so that we can love better. Hmm. The word you've used repeatedly now is formation. Yes. What type of formation are we talking about once more? We're talking about a formation of both mind and heart. We're talking about a formation of, um, which we'll talk about in four and five, but a formation that requires that we understand the nature of the human person, that fundamental dignity. That's really sort of at the heart, the foundation of the Church's social doctrine. Mm-hmm. If you look at something like Gaudium et Spes, that beautiful, beautiful document from Vatican II on the Church in the modern world, okay, the, the first half of that document is on the human person. It's on the nature of the human person and the role of the Church, bringing Christ to the human person so that we can understand ourselves. Mm-hmm. Paragraph 22, which John Paul the Great said so many, many, many times. I, I was recently watching a, a short documentary on his, his visit to Poland, his first visit to Poland after becoming Pope in 1979. He said this so many times in Poland. He said, do you want to discover who you are? You discover yourself through Christ Jesus. Um, you know, Christ reveals us to ourse- ourselves. That's, that's paragraph 22 in Gaudium et Spes. And so to understand who and what we are, as, as, as human beings, is at the heart of the formation, and it requires that we take into account the entirety of who and what we are, both our imminent material selves and our spiritual transcendent selves, which is why, again, you can't have an oppositionist paradigm here. It's not one against the other. It's that wonderful, beautiful Catholic both and. Right? Mm-hmm. So you you bring that the, the formation we're talking about is bringing those two sides together our our spiritual and our physical together and a mutual concomitant formation at the same time in bringing that about so you give the 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 practical intellectual information about what are, what does truth freedom justice and love mean the, the, the four, those four values and what are the principles the five principles there's this intellectual information there as well but then there's also spiritual formation for the heart on what that means for us in the everyday mm-hmm. and that's when you can we can draw from Saint Teresa of Lisieux and Saint Teresa of Avila and and the great wonderful example Saint Francis the, the examples of the saints within the world Saint Francis de Sales I mean there are so many examples of the social doctrine in the church's tradition already, we simply need to draw them out to touch the mind and the heart. 
they're so integrated. Yes, exactly. Thank you. They're Thank so you. so integrated and transformed. It's it, and it, we see it in so many different ways when we see wine that becomes the precious blood. Mm-hmm. We have bread that becomes the 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 body of Christ. Though the substances are uh, on appearance look different, or they say different things, are all integrated into yes. this beautiful whole. Exactly right, and that's there's so many things in the Catholic life that do that for us. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, the, our Our Lady is both Virgin and Mother. Right? Mm-hmm. Christ is both God and man. The Church is both divine and human. I mean, that we that's what the the milieu, the culture that we live in as Catholics. We we embrace the divisions. We embrace the the seeming paradoxes. And as I've loved to point out before, the word paradox starts with the P and ends with an X, which in Greek is Christ's name. It is he is the paradox. We embrace that the both and the communion that that is to form our hearts and minds so that we can be more fully ourselves. So we look, we judge, and in that understanding, uh, that in that formation, we see the intrinsic human dignity of ourselves, and we are called, because of that value, we look at the intrinsic human dignity of our neighbor, mm-hmm. then we are called to take all that in and then to act. Yes, to act. This is where... I was listening to the wonderful Father Barron recently pointing out the the sin of sloth, spiritual sin of sloth, which is at the center of the purgatorio and is a misunderstood sin. Uh, oftentimes, and I myself included, I thought sloth was simply just being lazy. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that if somebody was active, they couldn't be accused of the sin of sloth. But in reality, the sin of sloth, or, or in the Latin, echadia, it's, a, it's a, a disinterestedness in the spiritual things. And so, uh, practically speaking, then, one could be as active as one can possibly be, even to the point, incidentally, of working with the poor with regularity. Right? But if they don't pray, if they don't take the time to visit our Lord, if they don't understand, if they're disinterested in the spiritual life, that work they're engaged, the action they're going to be engaging in will and cannot be truly fruitful because they're not plugging themselves into the source of power, the source of love, who is Christ Jesus. The action we have to take part in, and we have to take part in it, the, the, we celebrated a feast of Pope St. Leo the Great, who was very clear, we, you have to, you have to engage in almsgiving, you have to engage in service for the poor. Leo's point is that the, the work we engage in has to be rooted in that relationship with Christ Jesus. It has to be rooted in that, that work in, in our spiritual lives. So much of the social doctrine that's taught today, so much of social justice, starts first with act. starts first with just doing, what they call praxis. Mm-hmm. You do. And theology is a second step. Uh, to quote Gustavo Gutierrez, the founder of liberation theology, no relation to me, by the way, mm-hmm. um, he, theology is a second step to reflect back on what we do. What the problem with that has been is that when theology is determined by the, my experience of what I've done, theology then changes. What I understand to be God and Christ changes according to my lived experience in the doing, in the acting. This is precisely why the Holy Father talks about charity in truth. Truth has to come first, and that truth has to be a relationship. And so in the acting, in the doing, we first have to have that strong spiritual life. Mm -hmm. We first have to understand that we have to avoid sloth. We have to avoid the, the disinterestedness in spiritual matters. Because the only authentic acting is going to come from a deep relationship and understanding of Christ's love. And we're not going to get that unless we foster that spiritual life. So in the looking and in the judging about what, you know, looking to see what the pain is and judging about how best to, to use it, the acting has to come from a place of interior peace, an interior relationship, an interior uh, um, confidence uh, that is garnered not through simply doing, but garnered by relationship and communion with Christ Jesus. This can have serious consequences when it comes to those who are active in any type of ministry, even if it's just us ministering to the needs of our neighbor. 
yeah. next door. You don't necessarily have to be on a faculty or on a staff in a parish to experience this. And the consequences I'm speaking of is burnout. Exactly. Because right. what happens if we're doing the action and are not, and it's not coming from our interiority, then we are there's a tendency that you can like i just said burn out Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you wonder where is this coming from and you're not that fire that is supposed to be feeding your actions and driving what you do we can see that can't we in in a misunderstanding of priesthood at Ah, a certain point where there was a time when I am a priest by it because this is the things I do as opposed to understanding the fundamental nature. My character has been changed because exactly. of that, that reception of the sacrament of holy orders. Precisely right. That, that, there ends the difference, and that's an excellent point. One of the great tragedies of our modern uh, approach to, to humanity, and this is why I say in a good number of my talks about, about the problem with the way social justice is normally spoken of is that with when you start with action with praxis and then theology becomes a reflection on that that's simple what we're doing is we're baptizing existentialism that that form of theology from the or philosophy rather from the 19th century wherein what we are comes after what we do mm. and it was sartre who said existence comes before essence what we do comes before what we are. What we are is determined by what we do. And don't we do that to ourselves? We are constantly putting upon ourselves our personal value as human beings based on what we accomplish, what we do, by how many meetings we have, by how many you know, loads of laundry we've done. This is how we gauge our value and our worth. Mm-hmm. And that eats away at the nature of the human person, and it can bring about that burnout because it's never going to be enough what we do, mm-hmm. and or it brings about the bitterness, the bitterness and the anger and the temptation to opposition um, against others. That is the heart of the problem of so much uh, of, 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 of the world. There's a reason why Marx and so many others adopted an oppositionist paradigm. It was because they first accepted the notion that we are what we do. There's also the real danger of we become the leaders in the dance as opposed to allowing Christ to lead the dance. Mm. And where I'm going with that is that in some cases we may continue to want to keep moving in a certain direction, and he may be calling us with the gifts and his understanding of what is needed in in a certain area or what time we need to be in a certain place or whatever the dynamics of the great omnipotent God understands in time that he needs to move us here, but we are so locked into doing what we feel needs to be done. And because we don't have the interiority, we don't know that it's time to just simply pull away and go over to this, this side. We may have to leave that doing that action that we're participating in. Precisely right, and there's a we we, we end up becoming it becomes ours, right? The action becomes ours, and we're so 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 closely associated with our personalities that that we we're we're not willing to give it up, even though we may be called somewhere else. Um, which is why precisely the action we engage in in social justice has to first come from the relationship, and let the relationship with Christ guide it. Because so long as we're, we're, we're plugged in and linked in with that relationship, then we're hopefully listening and, and therefore letting that guide our action. So at this point, number three, look, judge, act, where should we be in our understanding? We, we have to start asking ourselves where we are in our spiritual life first. Right? Because that informs look, judge, act. Where are we in our spiritual life? Do we have regular prayer? Uh, do we attend Mass regularly on Sundays? Right? Do we attend confession regularly? One of the things um, about sin is that it clouds our vision. Uh, it clouds our judgment, and it makes us slothful. Mm-hmm. Right? And so to be honest with ourselves, not in any kind of prurient or, or overly critical way with ourselves, we don't want to fall into temptation of scrupulosity or the temptation that because I've done these things, I am bad. But we want to be honest about who we are and how we've sinned. This is how St. Francis de Sales starts the, the introduction to the devout life, to, to be 
clear about those patterns in our lives that lead us to sin. We need the graces to be able to look and see those parts of ourselves to be able to bring that to God to be healed. Right? Mm-hmm. So, so in Look, Judge, Act applies to the spiritual life as well as the life of the social justice and social doctrine. But let's start there with the spiritual life. Are you going to confession regularly? Are you going to Mass every Sunday? Do you pray regularly? Do you have a relationship with Christ in His Word, in the Scriptures? It's there for you. It's His communication to you. When St. Therese of Lisieux would read a passage in Scripture talking about the, the bride and the bridegroom, she would say to herself, Jesus put that there just for me. And she was right. He did. And when you read that for yourself, He put that there just for you. So, do we have a relationship with him in the Word? These are the fundamental things to start with. Alongside that, we start to ask ourselves to look around in our family first, to look around then in our communities, to look around in our workplace, to look around the grocery store, to look around around us. Where is the pain? Where, where may I help? How can I uh, uh, bring Christ's love into these situations? And it need not be some grand act. It need not be that. It can be a simple and a little way of doing everything lovingly. And that will transform. That can transform. Um, And then you judge what what ought to be done, what can be done, and then you do it. If in prayer our Lord tells you, as you're doing Lectio Divina, or you're doing some sort of meditative prayer, or, or even if you're just praying the rosary and you just get the sense that you should be doing something, if God communicates to you in that way, you know what? Do it. Listen and and act on it and trust in him. And also in those he's placed in your life, maybe it's a spouse Mm -hmm. or uh, the spiritual advisor of your pastor or of good spiritual friends to help you in that judgment. You're absolutely right. Thank you for saying that. That's crucial. Absolutely crucial. Those, God put these people in your lives and, and, you know, hopefully they're living sacramental lives as well, Mm -hmm. but they put them in your life to help you um, in communion Right, with that relationship and then and how to to grow in the faith. Thank you, Omar. You've been listening to Regnum Novum, bringing forth the new evangelization through Catholic social teaching with Omar Gutierrez. To hear and or to download this episode, along with many others, go to discerninghearts.com. There, too, you can obtain a copy of Omar Gutierrez's book, The Urging of Christ's Love, the saints, and the social teaching of the Catholic Church. Or you can find it at any fine Catholic bookstore. This has been a production of DiscerningHearts.com. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Join us next time for Regnum Novum, bringing forth the new evangelization through Catholic social teaching with Omar Gutierrez.